It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Scent Blocker, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Welcome to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams sitting in a soggy cabin tonight. Dan, are you high and dry? Got your got your rubber boots on? I do. Have you got the ark built? Uh, you know what? You're starting to get the animals rounded up we'll two need, by two. I don't think we'll need the ark. It's been bad this week. I mean, the last couple of days, and and it's it was supposed to be really bad, but I don't think it's yeah. as bad as what they thought it was going to be. Well, down south got hammered pretty good. They I've been did. watching the weather, and you know it was supposed to rain here yesterday, but it didn't. Thank goodness, and I, I got saw, my yard work done. I saw a couple of people uh, that are doing some turkey hunting uh-huh. in Kansas. Yeah. And yesterday, it was nice hunting. Today, they're sitting in snow. My dad called me yesterday, and he said it was 87 degrees in Alabama. 87 down there. Nice. Yes, a little warm. But then it turned cold in Kansas. Yeah, it turned cold here, too. Right. So, yeah, no. You know, it's been one of those weeks. Kind of been a quiet week, but, you know, we've got to have those every once in a while. Yeah. They, um, the weather has been blah. Yeah, yeah, you know. it, it's it's kind of turned. It got real nice there for turkey hunters here in Michigan, and then uh, things kind of got a little sour here towards the end of the week. Got a little soggy. So now, um, one thing that hasn't been quiet. We're, let's just jump right into what we want to talk about tonight. Over on Facebook, uh, it's been pretty noisy lately with uh, DNR recommendations coming out for the uh, the deer regulations for 2017. Correct. They've been posting though. They posted them and actually made the recommendations to the National Resource Commission. You've read a lot of this. I've heard things, bits and pieces. I've, I've, I've just been slammed all yeah, week. I haven't what? done a lot of reading. They, so fill me in. They will. Uh, the NRC Commission, right? Which we talked to Lincoln Roan. Well, the DNR recommended to the NRC. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, through uh, the meetings they've been going, and Lincoln Rose crew mm-hmm. have been going at it. Uh, showing up and doing some talking and you know trying to get the aprs pushed Mm -hmm. but it sounds as of right now now this isn't final because i think the final recommendations go in june right they make their regs right the nrc but there's a time right now where we can actually voice our opinions is that right correct okay and uh they're doing that happens uh pretty much every thursday i do believe in certain various areas of Michigan. Okay. And uh, it looks like uh, so far they are going to keep the Northwest 12. Okay. They're recommending that. Yes. Okay. To keep that with, and then take away the sunset date. Okay. Uh, every three years uh, they want to, uh, let's see. I, I can read it right here for us because I can. Dan's going to read. Yeah. <laughs> gather, <laughs> gather around the campfire, kids. Yes. Here, Papa me... Dan's going to tell us a story. Oh, boy, really? <laughs> okay. You can tell I'm not feeling it tonight, man. I'm getting froggy. Uh, okay, so the North, we'll start with the Northwest 12 because that is a, they already have the APRs. Yep. So what they're going to do, it looks like there's, uh, sig- uh, is continuing the APRs, and they're going to, starting this year, 2017, they're going to remove the sunset date. Okay. So it'll be a forever thing. Until they recommend to do otherwise. Right. Right. So um, that is the first thing that's going to happen in the Northwest. Now, uh, the Northeast, uh, which is your area, uh huh, uh, looks to me they're going to continue, or they're going to call it retaining the antlerless tagging options, but they're going to add a three-point APR to the single deer license. Okay. Hold that thought. I just got a message here from Patrick Cloyd. Patrick, I'll address that later in the show. So don't think we're going to ignore it. But something about turkey hunting. Okay, so up in the, up the area that I hunt, the northeastern lower peninsula, uh, basically the TB zone, uh, where we've been dealing with TB for years now, they want to uh, have mandatory APRs for that whole region. Is that right? Which is zone two? Which, All across ba- zone two? Basically, reading this and how I read it, uh, the northwest and the northeast... Uh, will now have APRs. Okay. 
That's okay. how I, I read that. If they're going to add a three point APR to the single deer license, okay, which is because I think the combo tag is already have the APRs in it. They do, um, and basically, when you buy a combination tag, especially up in where I hunt, it's really convoluted. Um, you get two buck tags. Yep, you can shoot both bucks during archery season, rifle season, muzzleloader season. Or a combination thereof. But what happens is one of your tags is three point and larger, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. That is correct. Is that right? Yes. Three three on one side. Three on one side. And then the second one should be four, four on, on one, one side. side. Correct. That's so. that's how the, the rules work for me in the UP. Okay. But if you were to buy a lone deer license, buck tag, just your lone rifle license, or your a lone archery license you could shoot a spike. Correct. So they're wanting to take that portion away for those people who choose to buy one tag. Correct. That's how I'm reading that. For Uh the northeast. Also, in our area, you could also take your buck tag in DMU-487, which is the TB zone, and you could actually use that at either one of those tags as a doe tag correct or that, used, that used to be this that used to be the way for um how it ran in the up mm-hmm. i could do for the, archery the archery uh, for archery i could use my buck tags as doe tags but they took that away uh but in firearm season we can do that as well that, that that's the right difference. that's the difference see now for me in the up uh they've uh gone ahead and looks like they're gonna they're gonna add a couple antlerless areas it looks like they're going to keep the rest the same. So basically, wonder our APRs, or if you buy a single license, then you can shoot a spike okay. or whatever. Now, and it's going to be what? Three point larger? Three on uh, one side? Three, in, three in points the, on one side? In the northeast, it'll be three point APR. Okay. To the single deer license. Yeah. I'll, I almost wish they'd go a little larger. That You know, um, I hold my... When I'm out hunting, I, uh, I go for four points. Actually... I don't even go, it's not so much on antler point restriction for myself. It's more about age structure, uh, but that's a whole nother ball of wax. Right. That's so a whole, we're, we're just, into. but this is a step in the right direction. This is a step in uh simplistic form. It's going to save not all, but a lot of year and a half old bucks. Right. So um, that's what they're going to recommend. So in the meantime, uh, that is for basically zone two, right? Yes. Yes. So zone one, which is the UP, uh, which technically, we if you buy the the combo license, you do have APR. You do, but they don't for people who buy a single license. Right, you don't. And that's uh, what, I think that's the way. Is it that way down here in Zone Three as well, yeah, or no? It is. Okay. Um, so uh, for the UP, it looks like we're going to continue the way we are presently, uh, with the added exception of some. Uh, we're going to open up a couple DMUs for antlerless, and mostly public and private. And it looks like one DMU is going to be private land only. And which is probably not yours, that you're not going to get any antlers well, permits in your area? Of course not. Didn't think so. Uh, okay, so that's the north, that's the upper, and... Da, 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 da. <laughs> Troy says go to five. Yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you will now be able to carry a crossbow during muzzle loading and black powder firearm season. I've seen that change as well that they're recommending. Uh, Here's an interesting one. Eliminate daily antlerless purchase limits. Uh, is that in zone two? That is under other changes. Okay, and I wonder if they're they're putting that in like DMU four eighty seven up in the TB zone. I, I think that I think that goes. Uh, I, it, this doesn't fall. I think so. This falls under everything. It's mm-hmm. under the other changes. It's eliminate <coughs> daily antlerless per, purchase per limits. So I'm thinking if you want to go by ten, go right ahead. Yeah, the only thing I, I worry about that is when you get groups who are against hunting or are against a certain regulation. Like you said at your camp years ago, you go buy you go buy antlerless tags and pin throw, them to the yeah, wall. Throw them on the wall, exactly. You know, and they don't get used. See, to me, that way, I understand their, their thought process is guys who want to use you know their allotment of antlerless permits. They go in, they get them. That way, they don't have to keep making trips back and forth. And then go in, they can just take care of business. Right. But on the other hand, as well, you've got that other problem where people may want to. I think if you got to do play a, this stupid game, right? And I think if you got to do a little bit of legwork, because mm-hmm. really, truthfully, how hard is it to find a uh, licensed dealer, ticket agent? Yeah, right. 
I so, hear you. I hear you. Uh, an, an interesting one that I see here uh, on other changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, either name and address or driver's license or DNR sports card number may mm-hmm. be affixed to tree stands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's a whole bunch of tree stands that I've scouted and found. You're supposed to have your phone number on it or driver's license number. Aren't now. you supposed to remove them? Yes. Off, Sometime off, in February. Off, off public land? It's February or March off public land. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that doesn't work out so well. Right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, Troy also says you should have to take a, a, a dough before a buck, uh, you know, earn a buck. You know, there's we've talked about that a lot on the show before as well. Uh, that that program really didn't take off as well as what they had hoped for over in Wisconsin. Um, and they talked about that at the uh, the Deer Summit just a little bit. And I'm not sure the reason why the thought process behind it. I'll have to go, go back. And matter of fact, actually, we talked to Lincoln next week when we have him on the show and, uh, and kind of go down that road and ask what the, the thought process is behind that. You get to my age, you know, three weeks, it's hard to remember everything that was said at something you attended. So... What else you got over there? Oh, okay. So, okay, let, let's take a quick back here. Uh, Troy, uh, you should have to take a dough before your buck, right? You said yeah. that? Yep. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Patrick just said, just found three stands when he was out in the woods last week. Yep. I totally agree. Chad, uh, waiting for APRs in zone three. Yeah, yep. Uh, good luck. Okay, so. Well, that's what they're trying to push for. Right, we're, we're trying to go statewide. Yeah. That's what that's what the whole thing was. We want to do this statewide. As of right now, according to the email, the regulations are stating basically it's zone two. Right now, interesting one I see here: uh, urban deer management zone. Okay. Uh, the pilot. It's a pilot program. It's called the urban deer management zone for now. Listen, for Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne. Uh, they will continue of archery season until January 31st. Okay. So how do you get into those zones? How do you get tags for those zones? Uh, licenses included a deer license combination deer license and or an antlerless deer, deer license will be valid during the extended season. Okay. So this is something they're proposing to happen this year. Yeah. So they want they want to um, all rules and regulations for the archery season will apply. And the sunset date is a three-year evaluation, so it'll be 2020 when they revisit this. Okay, so it's like Detroit, Detroit metro area. It's it's right across the street from well metro. What, well, deer management zones, uh, what urban deer management? Are they going to be in certain areas? No, it, it's they're doing it by county. Or is it the counties? Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne counties. If it goes as they read it, then yes. If it is the whole county, we can we can bow hunt. We? Until January thirty first in, in Oakland County, in Oakland or County. Macomb, or, or Wayne. Wayne. Yeah, and we've got places of where we do hunt in those areas. Right. So, so that would be interesting. That that that's a new one. Uh, Patrick, uh, Southern Lower, all DMUs to be open for antlerless deer licenses, except for public land in Genesee County, because there is no public land. Exactly. Uh, Northern Upper, blah blah blah. Yeah, and I find that really odd. Of all the counties, this is the one county in the state of Michigan that does not have public land to hunt. As Isn't much, that wild? As much rural land as there is in this area, in the in this, especially in the southwest corner of the county, you would think that there would be some kind of state state land somewhere. Remove the sun. Remove the sunset provision from the pilot counties in the northern Lower Peninsula, which allowed. For firearms to be used during portions of the archery season by permit. That's an interesting one. Read that again. Remove the sunset provision from a pilot counties in the northern lower peninsula, which allowed the firearms to be used during portions of the archery season by permit. Did not uh, DMAP permits? I see. I wonder if all those are ag permits. Remove the ability to use firearms during the archery season in the pilot counties, except for the period for October 1st to the 14th. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if those are ag permits. Could so, be. I remember when they had some of those that went out uh, up in our area. There was a big ballyhoo about that because uh, a lot a lot of the people up there, uh, farmers in the, those areas, were were just shooting a lot of deer. Uh, actually, there were, there were year-wide permits, like block permits, and uh, just letting deer lay instead of taking and actually sending them. And my phone's right. ringing, and I hope we don't go off the air. I'm going to step out here for one. You know what? Let's take our first break. We come back. Uh, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, 
the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market, has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Throughout human history, one notorious killer has remained at the top and claimed more lives than any war or natural disaster combined. Mosquitoes. It's time to arm yourself and protect your family this season with ScentBlocker's new bug blocker for insects. Lasting up to eight hours, bug blocker not only repels biting mosquitoes that can carry the West Nile virus, but other biting insects, including chiggers, biting flies, gnats, and ticks which can carry Lyme disease. Field tested by outfitters and guides from Alaska to Alabama and everywhere in between, the results are in and bug blocker flat out works. In a high-potency sportsman strength dosage, using 25% no-nonsense DEET, plus two specific ingredients to target biting flies, Bug Blocker plays for keeps. For ultimate protection, pair Bug Blocker insects with Bug Blocker ticks. Welcome back. Second segment of the show here on the podcast. Um, well, we're having our Sunday <laughs> night, Monday night, Monday technical difficulties, difficulties and rolling right along here. Right. Um, on that thought, uh, these are going to go in June. Mm-hmm. So these are just some of the things that they're, they're proposing right now that looks like what they want to say. But that isn't the end. And everybody still has public opinions. Uh, We've got time public opinions. We've got here. some meetings coming up. Uh, Go to the Michigan Let Them Grow page. They're yep. posting when those meetings are. Matter of fact, Lincoln Roan, he'll be on next week. Yep. He's going to give uh, us information on who you can contact right. to who get to, your opinions, too. Who to contact. Uh, uh, it, it's going to be an old grassroots. Send a letter. Mm-hmm. Make a phone call. Make a phone call. Get it in front of them. Uh, it, it, it's almost like... Uh, Heading down the stretch, right? Yep. So he's going to be on next week. We'll talk with him to get us more information as to who, what, where, and how to, and what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can go to Facebook, look at at Michigan, let them go, let them grow page, and uh, see what's going on over there. It looks like they're going to have a, a contest as well. So um, cool. Just you know, hey, it's not over yet, right? Yeah. For those of you guys who who are on Facebook and who don't, uh, who aren't part of that group. Go over and check it out. Join that group. Um, it is a closed group. You got to be vetted and make you sure. Gotta be, you you got to be from Michigan. <laughs> you got to be. Well, yeah, you got to be from Michigan, number one, or, or maybe even hunting Michigan if you're up from out of state. Um, you know, you might be able to talk to them that way and figure it out. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of good talk goes on over there. And, uh, you know, if, if this is the direction you, you think things should go, definitely join that group. So, but uh, moving along, uh, you know, next week we talk about having Lincoln Roan on. Next week we're also going to have. Uh, if everything goes well, Anna Mitterling on from MUCC, who is, uh, we've talked about her on the show before. She works uh, between the DNR and MUCC about helping get deer co-ops started in your area. Um, right, and you were actually part of something just a few weeks ago yeah. that she was at. and uh, Yeah, the deer browse study uh, up at, a, at one of the co-ops just north of, of the area that I hunt. And it just wasn't one place. Uh, no, actually, it was uh, four different parcels of property, and uh, there was 20 people that were invited to this. Uh, basically, what she was doing was uh, getting people to help her with some of her research, but also teaching us how to do this. So it was a win-win situation, and we don't have all the results back yet, um, and we talk to her next week. Maybe we can figure that out if she's got them done yet or not. Right. But uh, it was very, it was a very interesting uh, day spent in the woods. You know, we, we went up to... A uh, friend of mine's place, his deer camp, and that's kind of where she taught the class. It just wasn't a 20-minute... No, we sat there for probably a good hour, hour and a half, learning about deer browse and deer browse study, what, what to look for, you know, learning what the preferred plants are that deer like to browse on. Uh, then there's like a medium range, and then there's the range that's less likely for them to browse on. And if they're in that, that least preferred and right. if you're seeing browse on the least preferred side, that means 
they're over browsing. There's a, there's an issue there. You've got overpopulation. Okay. You know, um, there's not enough food on the ground for them to eat and get through the winter. So they're all, all of a sudden when they start eating, you know, like, uh, uh, spruce trees, you know, things right. of that nature, pines, you know, there's certain pines that they don't like. And once you start to see browse on that, then you know, there's an issue. So, uh, but my job for the day was to count deer poop. <laughs> yes, it was. You told me that, and I yeah. said, "So, so you are certified able to count yeah, deer poop." I think so. I, I don't know how I got vetted for that, but uh, yeah, that was my task. And did you do a good job? Evidently, I don't know. I, I counted. See, there you go. <laughs> but basically, what they're doing is is when you do a deer brow study, you'll you build these what are called transects. So they're just basically lines on your property, and they like them to be at least a mile. You know, or a mile long. That's and there should be four of those. Okay. Okay. So you're walking back and forth. You know, walk down one, jump, and hit the other one, then back, and then back again. Right. You know, but there's a way they they lay these these gr- this grid out. And while you're walking the transect, as I was walking this line, then I was counting piles of. Were you count? Di- well, di- well matter of fact, Andy is asking that question. Yes. Were you counting piles or were you counting pellets? If I was counting pellets, Andy, I'd have been there all day. I'd still be there. <laughs> no, basically you're counting piles. Uh, the the theory or the the theory behind this is what you do is you're taking sixty p- steps or thirty paces, two steps per pace. Okay, so you walk s- sixty steps and you stop, and and then the person who's counting the paces off stops, and where he's at, in a four foot radius, four four foot circle around him, all the way around him, you're you're looking for six. We were looking for six basic plants or, or tree types okay. of plant matter and seeing if they were browsed, seeing if they've been nipped off. Right. Okay. And basically, you're looking about six foot high to about six inches off the forest floor. That's that's your zone in a four foot cylinder, basically. Right. And then you're, you're, you're checking the six species to see if they're present. And if they are, are they browsed? And then my job was to count during those that whole time you're going from one to the other to the other to the other you're counting deer poop okay piles and what i didn't know is a deer a typical deer white-tailed deer will poop 25 times a day so thus the mile mark that you're trying to hit they take that number of piles per transect line right there's a formula and they can figure roughly i mean not actually not you know an accurate but a rough general idea how many deers how many deer per acre that you have. you have in that area. Or deer per square mile. I'm sorry. Deer, deer per square mile. Deer per square mile. Right. So that way you can you kind of get your deer density, so there, to speak. There you go. You know, and then figure out, you know, if they over browsing. Right. Are they over browsing? Yeah. Uh, like, like you said, you know, you're going to look and see the, the, the six different types. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. So you count, you, 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 you look for, you look for browsing on trees. Mm-hmm. You looked for pellets. Was there mm-hmm. anything else in particular that you were looking for? They were looking uh, at canopy cover. It, you know, how, how thick was the canopy cover? Basically, was it more than 50% cover or less than 50% cover? And that's with leaves on. So at this time of year, we were in April. You know, you have to imagine the trees with leaves on. But it was pretty easy to tell. I mean, if you were in a if you were in, in thick with, area. Yeah, if you were in a thick area. Yeah, you could you, you get a general idea. It's like, okay, yeah, that's more or less right. than 50%. It's a general rule of thumb. And then that... Also leads to looking to see if there is regeneration because we're looking in the spring mm-hmm. and seeing if there is regen and and that's another thing to see you know it kind of tells if you know when these new plants start to come up are the deer hammering these things as well so, right exactly and were they um, we saw moderate uh, regeneration they classified moderate well I mean I, I say moderate it, it wasn't like the the place was flourishing I mean we were in a lot of swamp in, oh, okay in the, in the parcel that I was. I right. was in. There was some regeneration, but there wasn't a ton of it. So, yeah, it, it was very interesting. But, yeah, the thing that, that got me was looking at, at, you know, deer piles and knowing that, you know, it's 20, 25 piles per day on average for an average deer. Which gives them a really healthy colon. Yeah. Right, Andy? Yeah. So, you know, and the other thing when you're looking at it, too, is, and we've all seen this in the woods as you're walking through. You, you can tell one that they look like pellets. There's others that look like clumps. And there's others just runny. Yeah, you know, and it's it's deer diet, you know. Well, yeah, and what they're browsing, what on. they're browsing on, mm-hmm. what they're or uh, if there's a change in diet, yeah, you know, they they, they go through the, the the winter months, the mm-hmm. summer months, and back to the fall, and 
their their diet changes as the seasons go, right? Right. You know, the one thing we didn't see a lot of a lot of over browsing in his area. There were, there was a little bit, not a lot, um, but we didn't see browsing up high. Okay. Now on our property where I hunt, you can see the browse line. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, see, you know, it's like night and day. Right. And, you know, and, and you can see it anywhere you go where people don't protect their plants. Mm-hmm. You can see that line. And it's Absolutely. Like, oh, gee, you wonder what's browsing there, right? And thinking along, if you're going to do habitat, okay, if you really don't know what deer browse on, what their preferred browse is, or what their least preferred browse is, you might plant something that, like dogwood. I didn't know. Uh, the dogwood up here, the, the variety that we have here in Michigan, is a, a high-preference plant for deer to browse on in the spring, nipping the buds all off. Oh, okay. So if you're going to plant that for cover and, and try to thicken up or, or habitat, you need to protect it. I was going to say, you're going to need to protect it. You're going to have to fence gone. it in. Yeah, you're going to have to fence it in. You know, whereas, you know, like red pine, you know, something like that. Right. Or a spruce that they really, or a white pine. That's the least of their yeah. desirables. So those you don't have to really worry about as much. Did she say, by chance, or maybe, uh, you know, you were talking about that, you know, planting a dogwood, fencing it off. Is there a certain height that once six foot. The, once they get to six feet, they'll survive a, a browse? Yeah, that's that's generally the rule of thumb. They say if the it, average is six foot. You think about a deer getting on its hind legs. Right, right. No, but no, the for, the, for the tree to survive, did, did, was anything said? It wasn't talked about a whole lot. You know, I might have to ask her that next week because that, you know... I understand fencing it off, but at what point are you? You know, can you pull that fence off? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, medium preferences, white ash. That was one of them. That, okay, so that matter of like fact, that. that's what Andy's asking right now. So, what is the most preferred? Uh, dogwood, and let me go through my little booklet here because that was a couple weeks ago. Uh, low preference was uh, the balsam fir and the spruce. And I've got my little booklet here. Hang on with me just, just a few so, seconds. So the dogwood is a high desirable. Uh, Aspen's a medium preference as well. Uh, red maple, that was the other one. Red maple. Is high? Is, is, a, is a very preferred okay. uh, plant for, for them to, to chew on. And what they're doing is they're, they're hitting the ends of the they're branch. Just, they're, they're just hitting the buds. The, yeah, they're just nipping the buds off. Yep. So, yeah, the dogwood and the red maple. Interesting. That's... Uh, the dogwood and the red maple. And to find it the, sounds like the spruces are on the low end. Red osier dogwood. That's what the actual name of that dogwood species is called. Red osier dogwood. High preference. So if you plant dogwoods and you want them to survive, mm-hmm. you better fence them off. Now here's the other thing I learned. Going through, they brought in these samples, these actual twigs off of these six varieties we had to look for. Okay. And... You know, you think, okay, you look at a leaf, you can tell a leaf. Well, there's no leaves on now. So how can you tell what species is which by the by the buds? Oh, yeah, just by looking at them. Side by side, by side buds or offset. Oh, okay. On, on, on the plant. That's that's one way of telling. And and I never knew that, that certain species will offset their, their shoots or they'll have them right across mm-hmm. from each other. Across from each other yeah. or offset. Yeah. Uh, Andy's saying, and these are the new regrowth. Hmm. So what is most preferred? And hum, these are the new regrowths. Uh, I think, uh, Andy, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, but uh, so without any leaves on it, you just look at how the 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 stems or the new twigs are set up. Yeah, the new growth on, okay. on, on that that specific uh, species of tree. But yeah, those those are we're looking at, at high, medium, and low preference. Right. And the high preference we had two species. That were, you know, native to northeastern Michigan, and then there was two that we were looking for uh, that were medium, and then there was two that were low. So, so you were looking at when you when you came up to that spot. I think I got how Andy wants me to phrase the question now. So when you come up to that four foot spot, mm-hmm. if you had a dogwood there, mm-hmm. you would look and see how far up it was browsed. Well, you're looking between six inches off the ground and about six foot tall, right? And so yeah. if there was a fully grown dogwood there. Mm-hmm. Uh, or or a shorter dogwood, you would look and say, okay, here's a dogwood, and it's browsed. Yeah, you'd look at the end of the stems, the end of the branch or the the twig. Okay, and you see, you can see the actual uh, the breaks on the end where a deer has actually broken or nipped it off, because it most most of these trees at the very end, the very tip, mm-hmm. is a bud. Yep, you know, at least one. 
or multiples, depending on what species. I think red red oak was another one we were looking at, um, depending if it was on the property or not. That was one of them. You could alternate different one uh, and trade species out, like aspen, quaking aspen, or oh okay, red oak. Okay, you know, so depending on what was on your property, because you might not have a certain species on your property. So Andy, actually, it, 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 to answer the question, um, it's actually any age tree that's in that four foot zone. They're just looking to see what the browse is. We were looking at six specific plant right. types. Yeah, and, and if you found one, whether whether it be twelve feet tall or two feet tall, mm-hmm. you were looking for the, the the type of tree and how it was browsed. Yep. Yeah, there was places we went into, and there was. There was plants there or t- trees there, but they weren't what we were looking for. Right. You know, the study called for six. There was two high, two medium, and two low preference. Right, and that's that was their control element was six. Right. They they controlled it with only six, or else you could go. Yeah. Well, there was a couple plant species that we we saw there, and I don't remember what they were, but there was that didn't fall in our category we were looking for, but they were browsed. You right. Know? Exactly. So, but that wasn't in the study. Yeah. See, and that and that might lead them to a different study. Right. They might redo this study and then trade out the six for different six and then they'll go back exactly and look at okay we did the study three times six different yeah, high think, medium lows like i think a, one of the mediums was jack pine you know we had a lot of jack pine on our, on our per property that i hunt but uh you know where we were at there wasn't jack pine so you know it was swapped out for something else i think which was aspen was one of the, the species we're looking at in the medium so yeah you know it's there's categories, and then right. you, you get the ones that are in your area, and then you use that for the control. Correct. And, yes, Andy, um, they'll browse any size of the tree. Mm-hmm. They were The study was looking in specifics. Like Mike said, mm-hmm. there might be other trees they browsed on. But, yeah, it, it's and it's any age. It's They're just looking from six to six feet. Yeah. Six you, inches you know, to six feet, and they're looking for that. So. Yeah. You could have, you know, like a jack pine in our area that we harvested all of our, not all, but most of our jack pine out of, off of our property uh, in our logging project of, of the area we were yep. we were uh, logging in. And those trees were 20 to 25 years old. And uh, actually, they were almost past mature. Uh, the mature, va- the, the maximum value of the, the timber would bring. I mean, we waited four, five, six years too much. You know, it was, it yep. was starting to oh, die yeah. and starting to get disease. Starting to lose value. So, but uh, if there's branches low enough on those trees and the deer can get to them, yeah, they'll browse them. So right, it doesn't, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't but, matter on the age of the tree. But and it could, be, it could be a shoot that's this tall, you know, that we were yep. looking at. You know, a foot off the ground, a third nip in the top of those off. Yep, anything in between the six and yeah. six feet, right? Six inches to six feet. And that's, that, that's the study, mm-hmm. and you were just looking for specific items. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see... Um, when the results come out, um, was she able to garner right off the the bat as to? A there was not really a bunch of generalizations made that day. Okay. You know, there was four different pieces of land that were. You know what? I tell you what. Hang on to that thought right there. Let's take our break because we're running. Uh, we're running a little bit past time on this segment here. We come back. We'll continue this, okay. this line of discussion. So we'll be right back after this. So what do you do when you've completely redefined the way bows are engineered? When you've reached the pinnacle and the band starts playing your victory song, you start a revolution out of thin air. Introducing the all-new PSE Carbon Air, engineered with true carbon technology to be the lightest high-performance bow in the world. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much-needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. Welcome back, third segment of the show. All right, I've already forgot. What were we talking about now? <laughs> what direction were we going with this? Way to go, man. You're, you're, you're doing well. The generalizations. The general, right. What I wanted to know is, uh, did you give her numbers, and did she, was she able to quickly 
take the numbers that you gave her, jot them down, run them through the uh, the formula, and say, "Hey, it looks like right now pre no preliminary." Okay, so no, no, no. We we just turned in our data sheets, and she was going to take them back and and start working on them, plugging numbers in, and and compiling data, because there was four different pieces of property that we were actually walking. Um, I was on on uh, one piece of property. You know, I was with one group. There was one, two, three, four, four or five of us in that okay. group. Um, yeah, there was five five people in each group because there was twenty of us there, and there was four parcels. And uh, at one point, one of the guys had to leave a little early, so he took off. So four of us finished. Okay, you know, and, so, and that took several hours too. That just we wasn't... spent yeah about three and a half hours out out in the in the woods and uh, walking the transects. You know, the lines. And what was nice was. They already had, um, the gentleman that had us up to his camp already had general markers out for us, so we walked in a straight line. Oh, really? Yeah, and he kind of went and did the 30 paces, you know. So he went out kind of before everybody got there. And put a flag down. And and put a marker. Yep. And and he probably was doing GPS so he could make sure he was in a straight line. Could have been. I think it was. Yeah, I would. Yeah, you know, yeah. Their compass. Right. That's either. that's pretty much the the way they do it. So you do up, you turn, and come back. You okay. go over so far and then come okay, back. Okay, that was right the back. question. Yeah. yeah, I was good. So you you move over X amount and then come back. Yeah. Um, let me dig in here real quick. But yeah, no, that you know that's interesting. There's things that can no, be this done. is just the Michigan trees that we were you were looking after. Uh, yeah. This is a, this is the little booklet that she gave us to. To actually do to look at look for the right trees. Yep, yep, and examples because we could she didn't have enough examples for us to take with us. But we we can talk with Anna next week. Absolutely, you know it'd be and good to explain how the transects work and how far you have to lay them out and the quadrants and all that stuff. But exactly. But you know what? What's even cooler? But this time of year, what else? There, there's two other things we're looking for in this area as we're out doing this. We're looking for sheds. Well, that yeah, you know because I mean. Me, my, my job was to sit and look at the ground the whole day long. Oh, there's a pile, there's a pile, there's a pile, there's a pile. But also, if you're in an area that has morel mushrooms, you know, at that time of the year, you, you can actually find them as well. So, you know, it's not just looking at deer poop and looking at, at trees and making notes. There, there's much more to it, you know, and being able to spend three and a half hours in the woods. Not only that, we were out in the middle of, of April in, in a swamp, in short sleeve shirts because it was seventy degrees and there was no bugs. Isn't that nice? That was cool. Um, that that's one thing about this time of year is just awesome. Uh, by chance, another question: Did she talk about the percentage time percentage of time deer browse in a woods versus ag fields this time of year? No, no, that was not brought up. But that's something we can discuss with her next week. Yeah, basically, what we were basically looking to see how how much deer had browsed a particular piece of property. That was the idea behind it. And obviously, this what this study is going to do is it, it's going to lead to other things uh, that she's working on uh, in conjunction with the DNR. Uh, in, you know, in conjunction with part of the project that I'm getting involved. Right. With, yep. Uh, we've talked a little bit about. Um, all all of this all goes together along with APRs. Oh, it, 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 this all these little things we've been talking about for the past month. Yep, and we've got in a big ball of wax. And we've got somebody chiming in from Indy. Okay. Who do you think that can be? Would that be David Boggs? That would be David Boggs. And what he points out is that uh, we should also mention that the same species of browse has different tastes sugars and chlorophyll and pal- palatability based on soil mo- moisture, sun exposure, and trace elements, etc., etc. A tree even 10 feet away has different photropic panel. You can go real deep in this. Just He just wanted to say hi. <laughs> hi, David. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. And David, David has studied uh, a, a lot of this stuff yes, at, Purdue Univer- at the, uh, Purdue University. So uh, he, he's got a background in uh, wildlife biology. So uh, this guy definitely knows what he's talking about. He, a little bit. And actually, uh, once we get this, this project up and running, David's one of the guys I'm going to probably lean on very heavily and try to coax him and in leaving Indiana and coming to northern Michigan. Uh, I've been trying for years. You but. have been trying for years. <laughs> so, uh, but... He's right, though, right? Absolutely. So, you know, and, and it'll be interesting when we get Anna. If she's even got the numbers, she might yeah. not have them yet. But to 
kind of take those numbers and yeah. I'd like to know what, you know, based on whatever you guys did, what the deer per square mile yeah. number is. Something else that I learned uh, on, on a side note, let's chase a little bit of a rabbit. Here. All right, go. You know, and talking about, you know, kind of in the regards of what David had mentioned uh, a little bit, we also had somebody from the Alpena County Soil Conservation District there. Okay. And she was a... I don't know what her official title was, but basically she she knew her, her trees and her plants. Okay, she she helped us help identify what we were looking for for specific uh, plants that were being browsed. Showed us you know what the bud pattern was, whether they were symmetrical or offset, and things of that nature. Well, then all of a sudden, of the twenty of us that were there for this study, started asking questions about specific trees and planting things on their property. Oh, okay. And we got to talking about oak wilt. And something that I did not know is between red oak and white oak, the way this disease is transmitted, okay? Okay. Um, the red oak transmits it through the root system, okay, once, once it gets oak wilt. And what I didn't know is they, they root sprout, okay? These, these trees root sprout. And the white oak, when the white oak, um, I'm trying to think of how this was worded. It's funny you say that because the DNR just came out with the advises caution to prevent the spread of oak wilt disease. They said white oak is the preferred species to plant uh, in, in helping to maintain or curb oak wilt due to the fact that when it gets it, it encapsulates it inside the tree. It will encapsulate it and not spread it through the root system. So if you're looking at planting trees on your property, oak trees, white oak is, is a more preferred uh, species to plant than red oak because red oak will root sprout and spread this disease through it really? and they talk about the bug that carries this fungus it's yeah a, it's a fungus it's a beetle it's a beetle that carries this and once it gets it like if, if you cut a tree yep and you're pruning a tree like uh, a power company does yep in certain areas of michigan at this time of the year which the dnr recommends at certain times of the year like july to august i believe or june to august they don't want anybody cutting and pruning oak trees because what happens is when you open this, so this, you prune, it opens a sore up, okay? The white oak will encapsulate it and keep it from spreading. But what will happen is these bee, beetles will, will go to these open sores on the trees, right. get this fungus, and then take it to another tree that has an open sore and spread it that way. And then it starts spreading through the root system as well. Really? So that's something we learned that, is really that was really cool uh, to know that, hey, don't if you get red oak trees, don't go out and start pruning your trees in the middle of the summer. Don't go and do a clear-cut log harvest and an oak stand in the middle of the summer. Because you will, pr okay, because, yeah, because you'll take right down it to the stone. It opens them all up, and then all of a sudden these beetles get in, and they'll they'll get into the, the, the sores or the saps or the, the stump base. And then they'll just go and spread it everywhere. Bingo. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, because what do you do? You, you don't take the whole tree. You cut it and you use it either chip or leave the limbs. If you leave the limb, limbs laying, that's that's a source where they can get this. So, that's one of the ways oak wilt's being spread. So, yeah, I learned that as well. That was pretty cool. So. Does the age of a deer make a difference in what they eat? Hmm. Good question. I don't know. Um, I do know when we're talking about age of deer... When, and this is strictly on food plots. Uh, well, maybe not so much food plots, but an older doe, we talked about this before, called dispersal uh, of young bucks. We, we've seen this before on food plots, but we, we've seen it in the woods as well, that an older doe will protect her area of food source and, and kick and run off yearling. Yes. Yearlings yeah. so she can get the best food source. Because, number one, she's making milk for her, her fawns as well. So she's gonna she's gonna garner the best food source around. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question or not. Uh, actually, okay. So with that being said, we've got a, a David Boggs answer to Billy uh, to Andy's question about where do they feed in the woods or on the edge? Uh huh. And uh, they feed uh, according to David Boggs, they feed on the edges between the woods and the fields in the spring to get to get light first and more moisture. So that's they're feeding on the edges. So, uh, Billy Hoffman chimes in with, uh, he loves the QDMA and practices APR on his own, but have yet to see a scientific reason why APRs on its own fits in the sound scientific management plan that Michigan, by law, has to use when creating regulations. 
There was uh, Jim Brucker actually talked about the science behind the APRs and what was being done down in, in Missouri, and they abandoned that mindset in a couple counties, and they saw the d- disease in those counties explode. Uh, and I believe that was that CWD that they were trying to curtail down there. Yes. And it has to do with just what we we're talking about, about fawn dispersal or, uh, or, or uh, yearling, yearling buck dispersal. Yearling buck dispersal. It's they're And actually, Jim Brucker said that at, at the summit. Mm-hmm. He says they're, they're, it's a social structure in the way yeah. that, that, that the does interact with, with the other, the, the younger bucks and kicking them out of their, their core area and, and getting them to run off. Uh, from the from the place that they were born and raised that first year. Correct. And once they have the disease like TB or CWD, when they're kicked out of their, their area or out of that core area, they leave that family structure and they, they take off and go and seek out another family structure in a different area. And once that happens, they take the disease with them. So that that's part of curtailing that... Uh, right, and that was the whole the whole thing that they're missing, kind of missing the well, point. Well, yeah, well, shoot, shoot uh, shooting does with twin buck fawns. Yes, that was the key, and that's part of of, of the QDM and the APRs is, is holding those bucks in that, that area, letting those young bucks stay, let them letting them grow, becoming uh, the older, mature bucks that do most of the breeding. And you're right, and you're right, Billy. It makes sense because the DNR will need to use the science for the NRC to pass uh, a reg on it. Hashtag politics. Yeah, we won't go there. But, uh, yeah, no, you're right. It, the, the whole, he proved it. It was in Missouri. I think it was Missouri. It was Missouri. I they, think it was Northeast had, Missouri, actually. They had an outbreak, and they said, okay, we've got these three counties. Uh, we're going to abandon the, all the regulations we got, and, and we're just going to go in, and we're going to do it, and it didn't work. Yeah, it backfired on them, and actually they had an explosion of uh, right. Uh, so, the numbers increased. And that was of kind, diseased of, animals. kind of a, a, a wow factor as to... Mm-hmm. Hold on, guys. Don't overreact. Mm-hmm. Think about what you're about to do. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that's the that's part of this whole, you know, doing what the, going by the proper channel to get what they want to do. And uh, unfortunately, there's some powers that be in the state that, uh, like Billy said, politics uh, mm-hmm. change is not good. You know, get keep the politics out of this. If, if these guys would would start to look and listen. To some of these universities uh, that are doing some of these major studies, L- listen to some of the deer biologists that that really aren't backed by any group per se. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Dr. Grant Woods, Dr. James Kroll, who who do this for a living and and have their whole lives invested in this. Uh, we've learned a lot. I mean, you know, when we talked to Kip Adams. You know, we, we we talked to him actually off the show, talking about where a lot of these studies are done and the way it's being done and the things that we're learning. I mean, we're learning a ton of information here in the last ten, fifteen years. And he even said, "People, you've got all these colleges out there that are doing these studies that mm-hmm. are doing this stuff. Use it. Use it absolutely. And, and, absolutely. and matter of fact, uh, the predator prey study, uh, Mississippi State." Mm-hmm. Mississippi State is in Mississippi, and they're doing work up here. Right, right. You know, and I think the one report he was talking about was uh, Georgia. Yep, it was out of Georgia. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, it was just one of those things that it was just – but get sound information, though, too. You know, in, in talking along the lines of QDM, I do want to give a quick shout-out just because, uh, you know, we are affiliated with Mossy Oak. Uh, Ronnie Cus Strickland uh, was just uh, – he just joined the board of QDM. So he's getting heavily involved in that and then becoming one of the board members. So uh, congratulations to him as well. So anything else popping up there? Uh, no, it's going slow. All right. I tell you what, well, uh, we're bumping up here again on our last break. So let's step outside, take our last break. We come back. We got something we want to show. Absolutely. So we'll be right back after this. I shoot PSE because I like one pin to 40 yards. I shoot PSE for the perfect combination of feel and performance. I shoot PSE because you can shoot lighter poundage and increase arrow speed. I shoot PSE for the fastest bows on the planet. I shoot PSE because my livelihood depends on my bow. I shoot PSE because better engineering makes a better bow. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. I shoot PSE. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Throughout human history, one notorious killer has remained at the top and claimed more lives than any war or natural disaster combined. Mosquitoes. It's time to arm yourself and protect your family this season with Scent Blocker's new Bug Blocker for Insects. 
lasting up to eight hours, Bug Blocker not only repels biting mosquitoes that can carry the West Nile virus, but other biting insects, including chiggers, biting flies, gnats, and ticks which can carry Lyme disease. Field tested by outfitters and guides from Alaska to Alabama and everywhere in between, the results are in and Bug Blocker flat out works. In a high potency sportsman strength dosage, using 25% no nonsense deep, plus two specific ingredients to target biting flies, Bug Blocker plays for keeps. For ultimate protection, pair bug blocker insects with bug blocker ticks. Welcome back, fourth segment of the show, last segment. Man, we just did a whole entire segment on Facebook Live in between the commercial break. Right. So for guys listening to the podcast, you really need to tune in on, on Facebook. Tune into Facebook. I tell you, you what, you just though, missed 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Of, great deer discussion. And, but we're back here in the show. It's been a, a one of those weeks, kind of weather, but. Something good happened this week. And for the guys who listen to the podcast, you're going to get to hear it, but you can't see it. Right. Because <laughs> we're going to show some stuff We're going right to show now. it. But uh, they... Uh, I I got a text from from home mm-hmm. with a picture, and there were some boxes waiting for us. Sitting on the doorstep. Sitting on the doorstep. And it looks like we might have to take a day off of work. You think? I think so. You get know? out and do some shooting and uh, get some stuff set up. Well, what are we going to be shooting? Well, for those of you who, uh, who, who've who followed us for any length of time at all, here, grab that one, um, know that PSE is our title sponsor. We've talked about these bows this year from ATA, and uh, for those of you on the live stream here, I'm going to put this up here for the camera so you can see. This is my new Evolve 31 uh, for this year that we're, we're going to be shooting. And I fell in love with this bow at ATA, man. I tell you what, it's lights out. Um, it's got the same cams this year as the Carbon Air does. Uh, 80% to 90% let off. Yeah, 90%. Yep, and, and you enough. can change it right right on the cam without having to take and put it in a bow press or anything like that. So if you want an extremely lightweight let off, you know, sixty pound limbs, ninety percent let off. That's six. That's six pounds. You know, that's what you're holding back. Exactly. You and, know? And, and real quick, uh, just to throw out uh, out on Facebook, uh, we got a shout out from South Texas. South Jason, Texas, right on. Jason Sacco. Oh, Jason, yeah, he, uh, Outdoor Adventures with Jason on the Outdoor Podcast channel. He is he is formerly from Michigan. Actually, he's formerly oh, from yeah, Flint. He, oh, you've told Flint, me about him. Okay. Yeah, right on. So, hey, Jay, what's going on, man? But you know what? I shot this. You shot this. Mara shot this. Mara shot it. Fell in love with it. But she actually. Mara, we got your bow. We got, we got <laughs> Mara, uh, we have your bow right here. Now, hers is the Evolve 35. Now, she went with the longer axle to axle, the 35 um, axle to axle, but it's the same bow, uh, up to 90% let off. Uh, in purple. In, in purple. <laughs> it, you know, and I think they did something right. They went with a dull finish on, on them all. Right. So if you really look at it in these lights, you really don't see anything. There's no sh- shine to there's it. There's no t- shine on it except for just a little bit of a couple spots. Um. But we're excited to have these, excited to get these out and start shooting these things. Uh, the the roller guide uh, is the same as on the Carbon Air as well. So uh, a lot of features from the Carbon Air transferred to this bow. Um, it, you know, I'm just, I'm blown away every year when we go to ATA and, and shoot something new. Um, they just, they just keep getting better and better and better every year. And I cannot wait to take this over to Jim Beasley's at Spot Shooter Archery and get my gear put on it this week. And get out and start shooting with it. Um, unfortunately, I probably won't have this in the field with me next week when I'm up north turkey hunting. Unless you do some shooting. Uh, I'm going to have to do a lot of shooting this week if I do that. But So, uh, I think the combination... Does it open up? I think the combination of the Evolve and uh, some Black Eagle arrows will be doing some uh, good work this year. Get the job done. Absolutely. So... But, uh, yep, yeah, we're, uh, we're definitely uh, proud to be able to be shooting these again this year. PSE has been with us for, for several years now, and, uh, you know, we just love them. So we wanted to give them a quick shout-out, and thanks again for uh, partnering with us. Absolutely. And it's kind of, it, it, it's really neat uh, when we talk to uh, PSE. Help me, quick. 
Bobby Vargas. Bobby Vargas. Thank you very much. Bobby, you can send him an email. He yeah, forgot you this week. I forgot your name this week. <laughs> uh, that somebody actually wanted the modules for the 65% let off as opposed to the 80 to 90. Yeah, that's one thing. You, you can order a module that will, uh, instead of being 80 to 90% let off, it'll go from 65 to 80% let off. You can adjust it back the other way. Yep. For, for people who like a heavier back wall, a heavier uh, let off on it. Yep. I'm losing my mind, too. It's yeah, been a long week. Yeah. <laughs> It's been so, our Monday on Sunday night. Absolutely. But, yep, nope, glad to have those in the stable uh, this week. Probably get them out, uh, get them over to gyms, get them suited up, get them saddled. We're going to have uh, the R100 coming here pretty soon. We got uh, the R100. We've got some shoots coming up. Um, you know, and that's another thing. Um, we're going to get right there, fourth arrow. Uh, you know, we'll try to get these out. When we shoot these, we're going to, you know, get those out there and, Show the people when we shoot them how we like them. Absolutely. You know what? And, and kind of changing killer food plots here. I just want to give them a quick shout out. Last, when we were, t- or not last week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I was up north two weeks ago and we did the deer bra study. Yeah. When I got done with that, first thing I did is I took off, drove an hour south back down to my deer camp, jumped out, got all my gear, went out, pulled soil samples out of my field. And I shot some video on that. We're going to show kind of how I went through that whole process. But the reason I want to give Killer Food Plots a shout out here on this is I pulled my samples, put them in the bag, got back home. This week, I finally got time to go to the post office to send these things out. And I think you posted it on our page uh, of the box. You were were shipping them off. Yep. Took it to the post office, shipped them off. And within three days, I had results back from Tennessee uh, where where Nick sends his customers to to get these soil samples checked. Three days later, I had my results back. And that's counting the time that they got shipped down there. I mean, they were shipped uh, USPS. Uh, what, what's if it fits, it ships. You put it oh, in the box. The, priority, in the box. yeah, priority priority mail. Yep, cost me ten or thirteen dollars and sixty cents to put them in the box. You know, because I couldn't put them in the little skinny envelope. Right. <laughs> and them off for ten bucks. So I got them down there. It took two to three days to get there. They got them. They turned them around right away, and I got the results back. So. Um, you know, Nick, man, thanks right on with the, with the place that you choose to do business with spot on and, uh, you know, quick turnaround time. Can't say enough. So, you know, if you guys are looking for a place to, to hook up with, to get some seed this year, get your soil samples checked, get with Nick Percy over at Killer Food Plots, killerfoodplots.com and, uh, check them out. Absolutely. So, but, uh, anything else you got this week? Oh man. Nope. We need some sunshine, man. Oh, dude, we need some huge We, we had some warm weather, but it's been cloudy all week, kind of dreary, a little bit of rain. Now we got a lot of rain. And, uh, you know, I sat by the campfire last night. You did. I saw yeah. you posted. You fight. You know, I thought about doing that. And It was a busy day. Worked all day in the yard. Did a lot of cleanup of brush and things. Cut some. Cut a lot of brush. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I was just tired. It was dark out. I said, you know, what? we're going to burn some brush and throw some logs on the fire. And we were looking at the rain and wondering if it was going to rain. It just skirted us. So my daughter and I got to sit outside for a couple hours, sit by the campfire, and just sit back and chill. There that you that go. was good. That was good. That's that 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 is a peace of mind. So, um, we got another. Yeah, Bill Hoffman says we should do a OPC 3D meetup at uh, Lando Lakes uh, Bowman's Club. If I can get some people over from the OPC from out of state here, that's one thing we've talked about, Bill, is doing doing a shoot, um, you know, whether it be at the R100 or whether we do it in Ohio or right. Wisconsin. It, it, we we kind of choose the R100 because it was going between the states. states and and we were thinking about maybe picking one of those weekends that it was in one of the other yeah. states to go to and spend the weekend. Yeah, finally. So definitely, common, Bill, that's uh, on com- the radar. A common uh, meetup place, yep. for sure. And Jason says 37 degrees up there. Jason, keep it up that way, and when the snow flies, let us know. Yes. <laughs> so, but that's all I got this week, man. It's been busy. It's been busy at work. I, I haven't had a chance to do a lot in the outdoors. Uh, set by campfire last night, but the bows came this week, and uh, I'm looking forward to go, getting up north this coming weekend and uh, doing a little bit of turkey hunting. Yep. Absolutely. Good luck so, this week, man. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, it's time for me to get out and get something done. So I'm, I'm going to get out and at least sit by a tree and try to call some turkeys in, whether it happens or not, you know. And a quick weather update from Charles Byram, who's in Iowa. I don't want to hear about it. He's huh. got snow due tonight. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. You, you can you can keep that out there, too. That's fine. I thought he was going to tell me it's like 80 degrees out there or something. Yeah, so. I was waiting for that, but he says there's snow <laughs> in the lineup. 
All so. right. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for everybody chiming in tonight, watching the live stream. For those of you guys on the podcast, um, we talked about some things tonight that you didn't get to see. Go over to the live stream. We've actually got it posted on our Facebook page. Check it out. Check it out. And then tune in next week. Uh, we're going to have Anna Middling on from the Michigan DNR. Uh, Lincoln Roan from Michigan. Let them go. Let them grow. Uh, and, you know, if you got questions, uh, chime in there. Get on there. Uh, by about 7 o'clock, we'll kick it off. And yep. if you got questions, uh, matter of fact, what we'll do is we'll probably do a little uh, tease earlier in the day, and maybe we'll get some questions lined up for Yeah, and actually, when we talk, if if we get uh, Lincoln on earlier in the in the evening, because uh, we probably won't have him on the same live stream as Anna, just due to the way our technology works, um, we will try to live stream that as well. So it might be, actually be a little earlier. It might be 6, 6.30-ish. And before we go, you got to close the loop on something. Got to close the loop on something. What's up? Patrick Cloyd. Oh, the tag's in the mail. Thanks. Um, you know what? Let me sign up here on the podcast, and we'll continue this conversation on the live stream. So for those of you on the podcast, you know, join us again next week. Make sure that uh, if you're on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe. That'll do it for the Up North Journal. This episode was brought to you by PSC Archery. Black Eagle Arrows, Scent Blocker, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.